Father God, we thank you for your word and what we can learn from it, Lord. I pray that this morning you open up our, he our ears and our hearts to be able to receive your word. And Lord, that your name be glorified through it. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> All right, we're going to open up in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to be reading verses 13. 29. So Matthew chapter 7, oops, I'm sorry, not 13 through 29, rather 24 through 29 is what we're going to be reading this morning. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 29. That can be found on page 686 in your pew Bible. So Matthew chapter 7, 24 through 29, page 686 inside your pew Bibles. <clears throat> It reads, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice uh, <clears throat> is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority, and not as their teachers of the law. So we are at the very end of our series on the Sermon on the Mount. So this brings us to the end of Matthew chapter 7. And it has been quite a journey, I think, throughout uh, this series on the Sermon on the Mount, as I've endeavored to make it very clear from the beginning of it to the end of it, that every teaching that Jesus provide, provided within this series um, comes actually from the Old Testament, from the Law of Moses. Um, and in Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So we shouldn't be at the least bit surprised uh, that all of Jesus' teachings originated from the Old Testament. Because Jesus himself is the Word made flesh. That he is the very embodiment of the law, of the prophets the writings of wisdom, and even of the apostles themselves. Now, mind you, this title, The Word Made Flesh, it's also a testament to the reality that Jesus is God in the flesh. And we can deduce this directly from Scripture, from John 1.1, 1, 1, which says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he states it clearly as well in John 8, 58, where Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now this means to us that Jesus, among all other teachers, stands alone. He is the Word made flesh and is our authority and teacher of the Bible. So let us read those closing verses once again. Again, that's Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 through 29, and Jesus said, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority, and not as their scribes. And a few weeks ago, I know that I cited the story, Little Red Riding Hood. And within that story, she encounters an imposter, a wolf who was dressed up as her grandmother, who wanted to take her life, who wanted to eat her. Well, this week we're looking at yet another child's story by the name of The Three Little Pigs and the Big Bad Wolf. Kind of an interesting theme how throughout children's, children's stories that this uh, wolf character finds his way in and is always very uh, 
malevolent throughout them. And the way this story goes, of course, is there's three little pigs that were planning on building their homes. And the first pig was kind of lazy, wanted to cut corners, just wanted the job done. So instead of going through all the necessary preparations, he built his house out of straw. The second little pig was a little bit lazy too. And so he cut corners. Instead of going through all the necessary preparations, he just threw together a bunch of sticks and built a home out of that. But then the third little pig, that he decided he was going to do it right. He was going to make his home out of brick and mortar. The extra work didn't bother him. He was more concerned about having a nice, solid home that was going to stand. And the other two pigs, they didn't think much of this. They thought, they thought it was kind of silly. He was wasting his time at first. But then along came the big bad wolf. You know how the story goes. He comes to the first little pig's house with, that's made out of straw. And he huffs. And he puffs. And he blows that house down. And the little pig has to run off. And then he runs off to the second little pig's home that's made out of sticks. And the big bad wolf follows him there. And he huffs. And he puffs. And he blows that house down as well. And so these two little pigs that then take time to invest in building their home the right way and the right materials and a good foundation or anything of that sort, they run off to the third little pig's home and take refuge in there. And the big bad wolf comes along and he huffs and he puffs, but the house doesn't come down over and over until he's exhausted. The house would not fall down because the, this third little pig he made the proper preparations. He built his house the right way. Now, as a child, one of the things that I always thought was really fun was going out to the beach. And when you go out to the beach as a child, there's something that you like to do. You like to build sand castles. So you grab your bucket, you grab a shovel, you shovel the sand into your bucket. Sometimes I like to get a little bit wet because I like it to hold together. Um, and then, of course, you um, turn over the bucket, and hopefully what comes out of it resembles something of the sort of a sandcastle, if it doesn't fall apart. Um, and sand is a wonderful building material, by the way. It's so much fun to use. There are people, even professional sand, uh, sand castle sculptors. And in fact, here in Finley, not too long ago, you all remember the gentleman around Easter time would sculpt a depiction of the crucifixion into the volleyball court. Um, out of sand. Beautiful display of artwork that he would do and kind of added on a little bit to it each year. First it was a cross, then it was Jesus, and then it was the tomb. And you know, up until it was a huge Easter resurrection scene that he was giving us. Absolutely beautiful. But that wasn't me and that probably wasn't you. I'm guessing maybe there's somebody that's able to do that sort of artwork in here. Um, but most of us, it was a simply sand, pale, flip, and it might fall over, it might stand. Uh, who knows? And as we would look around when I was a child at the other sand castles that people were building, sometimes we did see elaborate sand castles. And I would think to myself, you know what? We could do that. So what we're going to do today, we're going to uh, build a sand castle near the water so that way as the water comes in, it can make a moat around the sand castle. So my brothers, my cousins, we put together this sand castle with the little moat area. And every time the water came in, poof, just knocked it all over. Didn't stand. Didn't stand a chance at standing. We did not have the uh, engineering know-how for one. And uh, also, uh, it just didn't have the right stuff to be able to stand up to those waves. Now, on the other hand, when we would go home, we had a big sandbox. And we actually constructed a sand kingdom where there was waterways and castles. And we would run the water from a hose through this system of waterways. And it was just absolutely amazing. Now, it's still made out of sand, but what's the difference? Well, for one, it's not getting pummeled by gigantic waves. But also, it was standing on a firm foundation, on solid ground. So it was able to stand up to some of the punishment that would come its way because it was built upon a firm foundation. Now, Jesus' illustration is a little more pointed. And I would challenge to say it's a little more convicting, a lot more convicting as well. Because he said that the one who hears his words and puts them into practice 
is like a wise man who built his house on rock. But the one who would not follow his words was a fool and built his house on sand. The funny thing is, we all kind of envy and lust after things with weak foundations. I mean, who doesn't want a lakeside or beachside home? I mean, think about it. The beach, the sunrise, the water, the air, all of it is just absolutely intoxicating to our senses. We love it. And the homes built along the shoreline are marvelous. They're expensive homes built by advanced technology that we are told that they will stand forever. That is until they don't. Because sooner or later, you're going to have the hurricanes. You're going to have the floodwaters. You're going to have the earthquakes or whatever else may come their way. And sooner or later, that home is going to fall. Our sin nature is like that each side home. It looks so good and so fun and so luxurious and smart at a glance. It's even possible that if our hearts are hardened enough that we won't necessarily feel ashamed if we commit a sin. I have a friend, and quite frankly, I could actually say I have many friends who would fit this bill. I had one in mind when I was putting this together, but so I'll just say I have a friend who um, lived a pretty wild life. He's what you would call an alpha male, always looking for a woman, always looking for a fight, always living life on the edge. And at times you start to wonder, how on earth does this guy get away with living life this way? And then one day he came to me and he told me about how all at once his life came unraveled. In other words, the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, and because he did not build his life upon a firm foundation, the house fell. Throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was not proposing or introducing us to a glamorous way of living. He presented a godly way of living. He presented the godly way of living. While the Pharisees and the Sadducees bickered and argued over what they thought that Scripture was saying, Jesus himself was revealing what Scripture truly meant. Remember what we just read in Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 through 29. When Jesus finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. This is a fascinating statement because even the people listening to the teachers recognized a lot of the nonsense that they were spewing. Their teachings and interpretations originated from human reason. What a dangerous route to go. And yet it's all too common, even from the pulpit this day. I'm not talking about me, by the way. <laughs> Praying that God has blessed this message and that he has rooted it firm in Scripture. What I'm saying is that we would actually never come up with a way of life that Jesus was proposing through the Sermon on the Mount. When you think about the ethics that Jesus proposed, the idea that anger is equal to murder, that lust is equal to adultery, that we shouldn't make vows at all, that we should turn the other cheek, that we should love our enemies, and furthermore, we should even pray for our enemies. I mean, these are radical ideas. These are ideas that, left to our own devices, I don't think that we would put together. It's much easier to be reactionary and to be pragmatic, but what Jesus was proposing was a higher way of life. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus saturated us with the ethics of God's holy standard. And when we are honest with ourselves, as we read through it, it's pretty overwhelming. In light of it, you might feel kind of like the Apostle Paul in Romans 7.24 said, Wretched man that I am! 
Who will deliver me from this body of death? And frankly, many cults would leave it right there at the end of that verse. They wouldn't take it any further into what it says afterwards, but many cults uh, perpetuate the idea that if you sin and then you die before you have a chance to repent, that means that you're going straight to hell. It doesn't matter if you committed your life to Christ. In fact, that makes your situation all the worse. That makes you an even greater wretch. I've known a number of people that have gotten out of cults, and one of the most consistent things that they have expressed is the level of guilt that cult leaders keep upon you. So they can manipulate you and control you. One person even told me that he thought that even though they would talk about Jesus sometimes inside of their gathering, he thought that the only way that you can get to heaven is if you were lucky. If you are lucky. That's not what the gospel teaches us. It teaches us blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Jesus did not preach this message to bring condemnation against his people. It was for, he preached that message, the Sermon on the Mount, for the purpose of saving his people. Because before you realize how lost you are, you have no hope of seeking a savior. In fact, when we read further, Romans 7, 24, when we read on to chapter 8, verse 2, he goes on to say, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus our Lord. So then I myself the law, serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law, serve the law of sin. There, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So there is hope. It's found in Jesus. And by fulfilling the law, our Savior has made himself the perfect sacrifice for us. That when he died on the cross, he bore our sins along with him. Upon his death, so died our sins. Now everyone that believes in the name of Jesus is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And when we walk in the Spirit of God, we walk by the power of God. And the Sermon on the Mount no longer sounds all that far-fetched. So what is the conclusion to the Sermon on the Mount according to Jesus? Be the wise builder. Stand on the foundation of the law, the prophets, and every revelation given by God through his holy book. And before we finish up, let me just give you three points of action. The first one is to challenge yourself with God's word. Ask yourself from time to time, am I really doing what this specific scripture that I am reading is telling me to do? Am I really doing what it's commanding? The second one, ask God to challenge you. Now, that's very similar to the first one because through scripture we're getting God's revelation. I'm talking about through prayer. Ask God to challenge you through prayer. And at, uh, <clears throat> ask him to expose areas where you have shortcomings where you have failures, so that you may be sanctified through the Holy Spirit's work. Third and final challenge, in grace, compassion, love, and mercy, we need to hold one another accountable to the Scriptures. We need to challenge one another. And I don't mean like these preemptive strikes where you walk up to somebody and say, hey, what sins did you commit this week? That's a little bit preemptive. That's a little bit too direct, I think, a little bit too forward. But quite frankly, the way that I feel the most challenged by people, probably most effectively, is just through good gospel conversations with people, through just talking Bible with people. You know, for instance, if somebody were to come up to me and say, hey, I felt kind of convicted over reading such and such passage, what are your thoughts on that? Or if they say, I read this today and I thought it was pretty neat, what do you think? Uh, or, you know, just something as simple as, uh, I wanted your ideas, your thoughts on what this passage meant. Those sorts of things can be very challenging, but when we keep the Word of God fresh on our lips and fresh to our ears, we're able to train ourselves to walk more closely with God in our daily lives. So we can help one another keep God's Word fresh on our minds to aid us in our growth as followers of Jesus Christ. God's Word is our foundation. And when we are undergirded with such a firm rock, yes, the wind might come, yes, the rain might fall, and yes, the floodwaters from time to time. 
will rise, but will stand upon a firm and solid rock forever. For he built not on flimsy foundations of sand, but on the rock of our salvation, to the glory of God for all eternity. Amen. Please bow your heads with me in a word of prayer. Father God, I thank you that you provided your word to us as a firm foundation, that, Lord, we might grow closer to your Son, Jesus Christ, through it. And through your Holy Spirit, we might be able to understand it and be able to share it with one another. Lord God, I pray that you would draw us near to you in these three ways, Father God, so you might walk more closely to you. And Father God, I pray that we would continue to cultivate a relationship with you through your word, and that you give us a love in our hearts to follow the commands within your holy word. We pray so in Jesus' name. Amen.